met on the side of Highway 177 in about Sing Road at about 312 this one, didn't we? Yes, sir. Okay, and what do you remember telling me? Uh, in summation that I'm guilty, yes. Of what? Of... I got another confession to me. All right. Let's talk about confessions. Yeah, um, there are quite a few, and they changed everything from deep freeze drama to a menacing case of who's who. We've got it all. We've got it all for you. Yeah. Let's get right into it. Let's do it. All right, we're gonna start with a really harsh one right off the bat. So a Reddit user named Snoop Dog posted this. I have a feeling it's not the real Snoop. Uh, anyway, here goes. My grandpa told my grandma before passing that he hadn't loved her for almost 30 years and he was close to divorcing her many times, but could never go through with it. Damn, that might be one of the coldest things I've ever heard. Not only is your wife about to lose you, but now she's gotta go on knowing that her husband has been out of love with her for 30 years? I don't know, I don't know. Was that necessary, really? I think there are some things that are okay to take to the grave. Like, if you didn't have the heart to break her heart when you were alive, why leave her heartbroken and devastated right before, like, just dipping? <laughs> seems, uh, seems a tad needlessly harsh to me, but uh, what do you all think? Would you, would you tell in that moment, or would you just kind of let that one slip? All right, this next story was posted online by an anonymous user who said that while their mother was working in a hospital with terminally ill cancer patients, she was given a deathbed confession that rocked her world. A patient had told her that while fighting overseas in Vietnam, he killed his twin brother and blamed it on the war so that he could steal his brother's identity and return to the United States to be with his brother's wife. And apparently he did exactly that. And he and his brother's wife even had children together. The wife in question had passed at the time of the confession, and the man's children blamed it on dementia. But after he died, they realized that was not the case. While going through his things, his children found a handwritten confession that had been written written decades earlier and stuffed into an old Bible confirming the killing and the identity theft. I guess when it comes to stealing your brother's wife and killing him, all's fair in love and war. Either that or the man was a straight up sociopath, which is probably the most likely answer. Family heritage and culture means a lot to a lot of people. So what if you found out that everything you've been raised to believe about yourself was a total sham. Well, that's what happened to 17 decimal 28's family who had this to say. My mom and her dad both grew up believing and hearing stories from my great grandmother about how she was the daughter of a Cherokee woman who ran off and joined the circus. It was a good tale. My great grandmother taught us all rain dances and other cultural things. All her decor and style was Cherokee inspired. She even physically looked Native American. My older cousin even got some college grant based on being 1 16th Native American. In my great grandmother's last moments, she tells my grandpa that she made it all up. Turns out her mother was really just a neighborhood working woman from European descent that dumped her in an orphanage. Uh, yeah, what a, what a mind F. Uh, like, what, what would you do with yourself after that? Would you just like drop all this cultural stuff you thought was part of who you are? Would you just say like forget about it and like try to keep it up anyway? I, I don't know, I don't, don't tell lies. Don't tell lies, folks. That's what I'm learning today. Next up, in 2006, a man named Tony Walker suffered from a life-threatening illness. While awaiting death's door, he revealed to his wife, Patricia, that he had been having an affair with her best friend. To his surprise, Patricia remained calm, and she listened to what he had to say without complaint. She figured since he was going to die anyways, he had been punished enough, and that she didn't want their final moments together to be filled with anger. Well, it turns out he didn't die. He got better much better, and when he was finally released from the hospital, he decided to return home to his wife, Patricia. Good choice, I guess. Maybe not. The two tried to work things out, but 
Well, it didn't work out. On September 4th of 2010, Patricia repeatedly impaled Tony with a very large kitchen blade in his arms, hands, legs, and heart. She called the police and claimed that he had attacked her, but investigators believed a different story, that she had killed him out of jealousy because the neighbors had reported that the day before Tony died, Patricia went on a 10 minute rant saying, I hate you, I hate him. It was pretty obvious what had happened. Patricia was arrested for the first degree killing of her husband, but the charges were later reduced to man one. In total, she spent 291 days behind bars before returning to the free world as a free woman. All right, this one is wild. The Catherine Kett case. Christine Kett was brutally killed in her home in 1867, found to have been struck multiple times in the head with an ax. Christine's mother, Catherine Kett, was of course, completely devastated. I mean, she believed that Christine's boyfriend had killed her and overwhelmed by grief, tried to get locals to lynch the guy. There were several suspects over the years, but eventually all were cleared. And 17 years later, on her deathbed, Catherine Kett made a chilling confession. She confessed to her surviving son that it was she who had killed Christine. Catherine revealed that she had lost control and killed her daughter in a rage after Christine had spent a night out with her boyfriend. After that, she tried to manipulate things to cast suspicion on the boyfriend and others in order to shift the blame away from herself. Just fairy tale levels of despicable. Her dying wish was then for her son not to tell a soul, so he went straight to the newspapers and the police. Next up, Geraldine Kelly, who kept a very dark secret hidden away in a very cold freezer for 13 years. When Geraldine's children were young, their mother told them that their father, John Kelly, had died in a car accident. It turns out that that was not the case, as in 2004, while dying from breast cancer, Geraldine revealed to her children the truth, that she had killed her husband after enduring many years of both physical and mental torment from the man. She had fired a projectile into the back of John's head while the pair were living in Ventura, California, and then stuffed his body into a deep freezer. Not only that, but when it came time to move, Geraldine had a moving company transport the freezer to her new home in Massachusetts. In Geraldine's confession, she included the final resting place of John, a storage unit. When police located the unit, they found the mummified remains of John locked inside of a now unplugged freezer. I can only imagine how bad that smelled. Authorities were unsure whether or not Geraldine had confessed to clear her conscience or perhaps to protect her children uh, because she didn't want them taking the blame should the police have stumbled across the unit on their own. Um, fair enough. In 1975 in Preston, England, the body of 26 year old Joan Harrison was found. At the time, the area was under threat from the Yorkshire Ripper, who had killed a number of women of the night, and it was believed that Harrison was one of the Ripper's victims. But the killer was caught in 1981. His real name was Peter Sutcliffe, and he confessed to taking the lives of 13 women, but Joan Harrison wasn't part of his confession. Her case wouldn't be solved until 2008. A man named Christopher Smith had been arrested for a DUI, and his DNA had been taken. He was terminally ill with cancer and decided it was time to come clean. So he wrote a three page note confessing to his crime, which he left in his home. He then died six days later from his cancer. Next up, we have a confession from an Australian gangster, Billy the Mouse McCulkin, who, while on his deathbed, admitted to taking the lives of his ex wife, Barbara, along with their two daughters, Vicky and Marie. On January 6th of 1974, Barbara, Vicky, and Marie went missing from their family cottage. Billy was originally a suspect, but was later cleared by police for lack of evidence. A statement Billy had given them, which implicated Vincent O. Dempsey and Gary Shorty Dubois led to the arrest of his fellow Clockwork Orange gang members for that specific crime. The suspected reason for the killings was that Barbara knew too much about the gang's organized crime, and after seeing Billy with a new woman, had threatened to report their involvement in an incident that involved attacking a nightclub and ending the lives of 15 individuals. I assume that the daughters were just collateral damage. Ironically, the gang was scared of Barbara snitching 
snitching, but it was Billy who ratted them out in the end. Talk about no honor among thieves. A Reddit user named DollisWolf21 shared a deathbed confession from his grandmother, writing, My grandmother was super religious my whole life, always going to church and doing right by her community. In her last hours, she said she really didn't believe in God and wished that she had not wasted all that time in her life doing what she thought others wanted her to do. It's pretty crazy for her husband, my dad, and aunt to hear her say that. Yeah, no doubt. Uh, look, whatever your views on religion are, I think the message that this really drives home is how truly important it is to follow your own path in life, like not to base every action on what others expect or want from you. If your religion brings you happiness, follow it. If you find it has no place in your life, don't follow it. Want to be a doctor? Go for it. Want to be a plumber instead? Do that. Don't wait till you're on your deathbed to tell your wife that you haven't loved her for 30 years. You know, it seems very obvious, but it really is easy to forget. Like, just try to remember, though, to stay true to yourself because you don't want to be in your deathbed full of what ifs and regrets. So, till next time, take care of yourself and each other. I've been Jerry Springer. Finally, finishing off our list today, we have James, not that James, but James Brewer, a man who confessed to killing his neighbor in his final days or not. In 2009, Brewer suffered from a serious stroke and he believed that he wasn't going to make it, and so he confessed to killing his neighbor, Jimmy Carroll. He had actually previously been arrested for the crime, which took place in Tennessee back in 1997, but he and his wife fled to Oklahoma and changed their names to Michael and Dorothy Anderson. Well, here's the thing. Brewer made a full recovery, and 32 years after he fled Tennessee, he was back in court with the exact same lawyer who had represented him in his case all those years ago. Brewer was charged with killing in the first degree. Oklahoma friends and neighbors of the pair insisted that they were lovely people, and their pastor even released a statement saying that both James and Dorothy had been dedicated to the Lord, unlike the grandma in the last point. But not only that, that they had been living in their own prison for the past 30 years, just knowing what they had done. And to the priest, he thought that they had done their time enough. So. Uh, the court didn't think so. He went to jail. All right. I do have a confession to make, though. Oh, God. <laughs> there, there, is, there is no James. I have been, I've been Olivia in disguise this entire time. Oh, my God. This entire, entire time. Wow. All the videos together. You notice me and Olivia are, are on screen a lot together. It's because she, she, the it's, AI it's just, just a just, CG creation. Yeah, it's just really hard to put them in a video together. Yeah. Um, I'm Taylor. And I've been your host, Olivia, and we'll catch you in the next video. See ya.